Hi, everyone, and thank you for coming to this webinar on universal basic income. Is it just free money? So, as it was hosted by the wonderful Federation of Young European Greens, we've got one of the co spokespersons with us, Katri, and she is here to tell us what FYG is and what it is up to this year. Yes, thank you, Eleanor. So, hi, I'm Katri, I'm co spokesperson of Federation of Young European Greens, or FIG, as, as we like to call it. And FIG is an umbrella organization to over 40 different organizations of green youth, young greens. And we are doing a lot of cool activities like this webinar, which is brought to you by our very good and, and effective um, Social Europe working group. So, thanks, thank you for organizing this. And before I go to our activities, what are we have, have coming now before the European elections 2019 and also after it, I want to very shortly share you my thoughts why I really think that a universal basic income is needed. So I'm coming from Finland, which is no more known for the Santa Claus living in Lapland, but more likely to be the promised land of universal basic income, but more about the experiment uh, that we've had. Um, Lucas, one of our experts, can tell you a little bit later. But from my point of view, I have been very much dreaming about dreaming about the universal basic income for the last months because um, after I, I uh, quit working in my previous job in, in late October, I got into this weird gap where I haven't been able to get any benefits because I'm still a student, there's one exam for me to go, so I don't anymore get the student allowance. But neither I am unemployed because I'm a student, so I don't get also the unemployment benefits. So it, have been, it has been quite a struggle to, to come along um, without any kind of income for four months altogether. So for this kind of moments, I really wish that we could have a working uh, universal basic income, which would simplify the tax and transfer system and also eliminate a lot of bureaucracy where you can somehow get like a stuck into, like I have been stuck in it for the last few months. And universal basic income is also, it has a lot to do with the social justice. And social justice is one of the core principles of FIG. And especially this year, we will be highlighting the importance on educating young people and for advocating the social rights uh, among young Europeans. And how are we going to do it? Is that uh, we educate a lot and do a lot of capacity building with our member organizations. And for example, we have a really cool um, unconference coming in Italy, in Bologna, where you can right now apply for the next coming week. And with this um, conference that we will have in Bologna, we will try to tackle the, um, the challenges that come with housing, that come with the healthcare, and also with the very precarious times that we are right now living, and es especially the young people. And we see that the universal basic income could be something that could be developed through the experiments to guarantee us both the prosperity and freedom in times when you when you are um, living with job insecurity, for example, and this is something that we will talk in Bologna. If you want to apply to this uh, unconference, as we call it, you can do that in a website, which is fig.org, and um, and also uh, later this year, just before the um, European elections, we will have a major campaigning event in in Madrid. And we also want to gather there a lot of young European Greens from all over Europe. And you will find more information on that if you follow us on social medias, like in Instagram, Twitter and Facebook. And that's not it yet, because we will also have a summer camp theme on the social rights. And that will be taking place in Serbia this summer. And that will be a whole week full of social rights, full of universal basic incomes, and meeting very cool young activists from all over Europe. So I hope you will follow us on, on social media and also check our websites where you can find more about what are we doing for social justice and how are we advocating for it. So hope to see you campaigning for more green and more fair, more um, a safe Europe in the in these coming elections and hope to see you in our activities and now I give the space for Eleanor and for our experts and I hope and I, I know it will be a very interesting debate 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Katri. And yes, I can also vouch that the events this year for FYG are going to be completely awesome and inspiring for young people. So before we get stuck into the debate, I'm just going to give a brief overview of what exactly is universal basic income. I'm sure some of you come because you know what it is. Maybe some of you have absolutely no idea before I hand it over to the experts. So the idea of universal basic income is that it is a monthly amount given by the government to everybody in the state, no strings attached. Um, the idea is to reduce bureaucracy and in inequality in the welfare system. So for example, if you're unemployed, rather than going on to unemployment benefits and having to prove every week or so that you are actively looking for a job, everybody gets given the same amount of money and it's a good secure safety net. Um, there's been a few pilots of the scheme. We're going to be hearing a lot about Finland, um, but there's also been a pilot scheme in the Netherlands. And recently in the news, it's been announced that Sheffield in the UK might be having a pilot scheme for universal basic income, which is great. Um, so today, well, tonight we're going to be debating can universal basic income guarantee workers' rights during automation of jobs? Can, can it protect, protect young people from job precarity? And can it ensure a decent standard of living for all? So, but first, I'm going to introduce our awesome speakers. So first up, we have Francine Mestrum. She has a PhD in social sciences. She has worked at the European institutions and several Belgian universities. Her research is about the social dimension of globalization, poverty, inequality, social protection, public services and gender. She's an active member of the International Council of the World Social Forum and helps in the organization of the Asia Europe People's Forum events. She is the author of several books in Dutch, French and English. Um, she's written about development, poverty, inequality and social commons. And she is also, if that's not enough, the founder of the global network, Global Social Justice, and it currently works on a project for social commons at socialcommons.eu. So welcome, Francine. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Thank you. Um, next up, we have Natalie Bennett. She was the leader of the Green Party of England and Wales from 2012 to 2016. Uh, she's currently working still for full time for Green Party politics, and she is based in Sheffield in the UK. Uh, she's also a member of the board, the Green European Foundation. And universal basic income is one of her chief political interests, but she's also finding the time to try and stop Brexit and fracking. Uh, in a previous life, she was editor of the Guardian Weekly newspaper and founder of the blog Carnival of Feminists. So thanks for joining us, Natalie. And last but definitely not least, we have Lucas Kopleinen. Sorry for the pronunciation. He is a policy researcher at the Green Think Tank in Finland. He is currently preparing a report on how to develop the Finnish social security model during the next decade. He has worked with the Green Party in Finland to update their basic income model and the stepping stones towards it. He began his activism with the Green Youth and Students of Finland. And when he's not pondering basic income, he is studying music at the University of Arts Helsinki. So welcome one and all. Great. And so now just to understand where, where you're all coming from on universal basic income, we are going to ask you each to summarize what is your opinion of UBI in three sentences. So, Francine, if we could start with you. <coughs> this is not serious, but I, I have to start. But okay, I will. <laughs> uh, I'm not an advocate of uh, universal basic income because, uh, in fact, I'm strongly against it uh, for a very simple reason. All the, or almost all, the problems that are raised when talking about the advocates of social of uh, universal basic income are real they're relevant they're, they're very important but i think that the solution that you find for ubi is not the right answer i'm in favor of a good social protection that gives more solidarity in, in society, that gives more equality in society, and that can be indeed a fuller answer to all the social problems that we are faced with, and that can really guarantee social justice. And I think that UBI cannot. I hope we will have the opportunity to come back to all these points in a minute, but I am against a universal basic income. That's it, thank you. 
<laughs> Thank you, Francine. Yep, we want to have both sides of the debates, of course. So, uh, <laughs> and to kick it off, Natalie, I think I believe you're in favour of universal basic income. So, could you summarise your position in three sentences? Certainly. I mean, I'm in favour in the Green Party of England and Wales. It's been our policy for more than 40 years. Um, my top three arguments for universal basic income are, first of all, that we would all accept and, you know, even lots of people on the right would accept a human right to life. Now, life implies food, shelter, the basics. Yet, if you, whatever you have a conditional welfare system, some people will fall through the cracks. People aren't guaranteed that basic human right to life to have the security of putting food on the table, keeping a roof over their head that UBI can provide. Secondly, I would say that UBI provides a way in which people can use their skills and talents will, well and make their own choices in life. Um, at the moment, I mean, we had an event at the last Green Party conference about um, uh, UBI for creatives. And if you perhaps just graduate from university and you want to become a composer or an artist, or you've got a great idea for a small business, um, to keep, she, keep the wolf from the door, or if you're a single parent with a couple of kids, you want to start a small business, you're not guaranteed an income. And very often you'll be forced off to go and work in a call centre, something that could kill off your talents, not give you the chance to develop your skills. So it's a way to use the talents of society well. And thirdly, the crucial thing I'd say too, is why it's essentially a green policy, is at the moment that insecurity, fear of want is actually driving people to want to have more, want to grab more, have the bigger house, have the higher income, keep that really high paying job because they fear sliding down to nothing. You know, we see so many homeless on the streets of Britain now. And UBI means if people feel more secure, they don't feel the need to have so much, which is why it's very fundamentally an environmental policy as well as a social justice one. Great. Thank you so much. A lot to pick already. Um, and finally, Lucas, if you could summarise your stance on universal basic income. In three sentences. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, in three sentences. Um, well, okay, I would say personally, um, it has been a long running theme in my political activism since, um, I don't know, a few years back now. And I see great potential in it. It would be a big shift uh, in thinking both in practical terms and also like from the ideological standpoint. Um, and um, yeah, I, I would be a proponent of it, but also I would like to pose false dichotomies. Like for example, in Finland, it's very strictly, I mean, the political discussion has been really strictly basic income or means to test benefits, like not anything in between. So I think uh, we should see basic income as a means to an end, not, not an end in itself. Great, thank you so much. Um, going to start with you again, Shaitoe. So we've touched upon the Finnish pilot, and I think anybody who's heard of <clears throat> basic income usually thinks of Finland. So Lucas, I was just wondering if you could just tell, talk to us about what the Finnish pilot is like has said about universal basic income, what has failed to say, and like what do you think should be the next steps for Finland? Yeah, sure. So basically, uh, we just had a two year long experiment where uh, 2000 participants were given 560 euros a month, uh, no strings attached, so which is basic income, right? And um, from the get go, it was known that this experiment would be limited. So but it was limited in both the size, uh, the, the length, and also in the, uh, <clears throat> sorry, it was also limited in the selection of the participants. So uh, a really great deal of them were already long-term unemployed people. So which obviously makes it really difficult to get um, any usable results out of it. Uh, and so, yeah, and there was a lot of political pressure to get the experiment going quickly. And now we have the first like pre preliminary results from it and basically the re the results say that compared to the control sorry compared to the control group uh unemployment did it come down but also did not go higher so it was about the same but the well-being of those in, in the experiment actually came up it, it become be, became better so in that sense it, it could be seen as you know like a, a point for basic income, but as I said, it was also quite limited. And the questionnaire to the to the participants um, hasn't been answered very well. So um, we, we will be getting more um, more results later in the spring, and also like 
one year from now when we get results from the next year. So basically, whatever you want to hear, whatever you want to read, you know, in between the lines, you can do it like either like whether you're pro or against basic income. But 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 also a lot of people in, in Finland in Finland, like many politicians have been advocating for new, bigger experiment um, in the next term, which starts uh, this summer. Great. Thanks a lot. OK, so now we're going to go and I'm going to ask each and one, every one of you, um, how can universal basic income be economically sustained or not? So, um, Natalie, I think if you'd like to answer first. OK, well, I can begin with the proposal that the Green Party of England and Wales put forward for the 2015 election in the UK. Um, now, this was only a draft proposal we were putting forward to. What we were saying was, you know, had the UK entirely turned its politics around and elected a Green government, despite our first past the post electoral system, uh, we were saying that we would run trials in the first term of a Green government with a view to introducing it in the second term. But in short, basically, what this proposal was, was about half the cost was met from the savings from existing benefits that were rolled into universal basic income. And the other half came from basically rich individuals, multinational companies paying their way far more than they are with the very unprogressive British tax system. So about half the costs came from existing, were not new costs, and about half the costs were, were fed in from the extra taxes. Now, one of the things that was worth saying about this is because the UK has a grossly distorted, incredibly expensive in some parts of the country housing market was we had to pay housing benefit as well. And we also paid um, some extra benefits to single parents to look at the equity issues. So it wasn't 100 percent you know, pure basic income and nothing else. Also, disabled people um, received the extra benefits, actually restoring back to a level it had been in 2010. So you know, this is affordable. One of the things we often say in the UK is, you know, after the Second World War, uh, the country was incredibly poor it had been bombed to pieces and yet somehow we created the nhs and the welfare system mm. which has been being torn apart over the past um you know decade or so so you know, with the will it's perfectly demonstrable to say that this is affordable awesome great thanks a lot uh francine over to you well, I think it is not affordable. <laughs> I think it is not affordable because because um, there has there has been a lot of research into it. Um, ILO, IMF, OECD, they all say it is not affordable. We heard in Belgium two major researchers showing that it is not affordable. Now, um, this this is a very important point, and that is also one of the reasons why, in fact. There has been no UBI pilot at all till now. I mean, the Finnish experiment was just a small experiment on a very selected number of people. All the experiments that have been going on on UBI are not real UBIs. They are a kind of guaranteed guaranteed minimum income. And that is something quite different. And that would be perfectly affordable. And that is what I would like to promote and like to defend. That is a system that can help people who really need help. And it is not means tested. It can be given in, in several different ways. But the UBI as such, a real UBI for the whole of the population in a country or a region is, as far as all the research uh, shows, not affordable. Also interesting, great. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lucas, if you got anything to add to these points? Yeah, uh, I'll ask about that, about the difference between UBI and guaranteed minimum income at some, some point. But uh, yes, uh, like part of my work, uh, uh, as part of my work, uh, I've been uh, making calculations for this and I mean it is it is um, fundable but obviously it depends on the you know the the size of the basic income so um and, and that is why also I would advocate up to kind of go towards it in small steps so then it would be a, a controlled process and obviously it could be then financially kind of um, balanced with the budgets but I would also see that in addition to introducing more like i mean like a more, more money transfers like this 
then our taxation would also have to be changed so that the income tax together with the UBI would act in a consistent way and also try to kind of steer taxation towards good kind of taxation. For, for example, like in the Merle, and, and the, I think it's Merle's review, yeah, there's some like examples of good taxation, for example, land tax, uh, environmental tax, and in, in, like tax those more instead of income tax effectively. So yeah, I, I think it is economically feasible, but it should maybe first be introduced as a small basic income. Great, hey, thanks a lot. Um, and now our next question is going to focus on like, why is universal basic income important for young people in particular? So I think it's only fair if we ask Lucas first. Yeah, I would say like maybe, uh, I think like my generation, I'm now, I'm uh, 29 now and uh, the world like, like economically and also environmentally is more unstable than it has been, let's say for our parents. And to kind of balance out that instability in the markets and in the job sector, uh, I think basic income would be a great tool for that, especially like um, as we have maybe seen in some future scenarios where the middle class will might kind of disappear in Europe and we will have like very well off people and then poorer people. And basic income would be a way to kind of still kind of keep everyone on board in the society. Um, yeah, I think that would maybe be like the biggest argument for young people. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, and Natalie, do you have anything to add to that? Well, I think I'll come back to a couple of things we raised in the original discussion. One, which was the question of a guaranteed minimum income. And if you have that guaranteed minimum income, the problem is that actually, if you then start to earn some money, is you then lose a large chunk of that money. It's the benefit traps that actually was the reason why in Finland, a right wing government was trying to remove benefit traps. So to encourage people who are long term unemployed to work at all. So the difference is with a guaranteed minimum income, you get that min income, but then you immediately start to lose benefits. Whereas you know, the advantage of having, having a UBI is that the taper off is much, much slower. Uh, and so you still gain from working in a way that you don't necessarily with a guaranteed minimum income. Um, I just wanted to pick up on um, Francine's point about, you know, we haven't had trials before. Well, there was actually a trial in the 1970s in Canada. And the interesting thing is that actually the result, the results for this were actually were actually locked up for uh, for decades. Um, there's also an interesting case study from the uh, eastern tribe of the Cherokee in the US um, where they actually sort of slightly morally questionable, but they brought in a casino um, and they distributed the profits from that to everybody. And there's some really interesting research on how that improves the mental health of particularly young people. So that feeds into this question about young people is that growing up in a more secure society in a more secure household, you know, we have very good evidence that that's good for people's mental health and well-being from the very young age. And then for young people at the moment, of course, I mean, I've got some questions to ask. We'll probably get to the issue of automation, but there is that threat hanging there. There's also the fact that the world changes so fast now. So you might have tra trained as a young person for a job and do that for a couple of years and that job, that whole industry disappears. Uh, and so then you've got to pick up again, as our FYEG rep was saying, you, know, you get trapped in the gaps, particularly most likely when you're young, when you also don't have the financial resources to actually the cushion that you might have built up when you're a bit older. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Really interesting stuff. Um, and so, Francine, do you want to have a comment on young people or like respond to Natalie's comment? Yeah, I have, I have two comments. Um, first of all, the Canada experience of the uh, 1970s was also a kind of negative income tax. It was not a real UBI. At the end of the year, people came to look what you had earned. And if you had not earned enough, then okay, you could keep the money. If you had earned enough, then you had to, to give back the money. So it was not a real UBI. The, the, the casino, the casino example is different. That is a kind of dividend. And I'm totally in favor of any extra income that could be made from a financial transaction tax, for instance, or from a casino or from whatever or from uh, uh, resource exploitation, what, which uh, is the case still in, in, in Canada today, the, in, in Alaska, 
that kind of money you can distribute among the population, but that is totally, totally dissociated from your labor activities and from your other incomes. It is just a dividend that you give to all people, irrespective of what they earn and what they do. And that is a very different system. And I think we have to be very, very careful when speaking about UBI because People speak about UBI thinking it is everything, every allowance that people get. And that is not the case. We have, maybe it is because I live in Belgium and we have still a very good social protection system that I am so strongly against the UBI because all the problems that have been raised here for young people, for people who want to go into another job, for people who want well, to stop work for six months or for a year. We have systems for that. People can get allowances. No one, no one should ever be without a decent income in his or her life. No one. And we can do this with a social protection system that takes care of equality, that takes care of solidarity. And that is why being in agreement with, with, with the problems you raise, uh, I'm not in agreement with the solutions you give, because there I think we can do much better with a good social protection system. <laughs> Thank you, Vancine. Uh, and Lucas, do you have something to add? Yeah, uh, just a couple of comments. Yeah, like like here in Finland, we're in the grateful position that we, are, we also have a really like a uh, powerful and good social uh, security model system here and and we, we also like you know which means like you know if, if you actually need money you know it will be there for you but it's also uh, hidden under a lot of bureaucracy so so maybe i think like the idea with basic income is that we kind of give the same money the same promise that we already have in finland but it just makes it more streamlined it makes it more accessible because we also have a lot of people who just don't apply for the benefits for, for the benefits that they would be entitled to because they don't have the personal resources or or it's just like too difficult so i think it's in a way more like a way of doing the same thing we do now but more efficiently and without the bureaucracy because that will always be a problem uh and also i wanted to comment on the negative income tax uh, now the green i mean the party the green party in finland has stated that that they can go with either a traditional uh, ubi which is the you know one sum for all or negative income tax because the end result is the same and they they are both uh, seen as basic income so basically I mean there's just two different ways of doing the same thing I see benefits and caveats in both. Hi. If I if I can just come in then if that's okay go ahead. Um, I I actually visited Finland with the um, Green European Foundation. And we spoke to some um, social workers who worked with people who were you know, suffering pretty severe disadvantages, drug and alcohol problems, mental health problems, you know, long term unemployed. And one of the things talking to them, they said they spent about 70 percent of their time helping their clients to actually get the benefits they were entitled to. Now, if you take away the conditionality, then they could actually spend most of their time that they're not spending now actually trying to help the clients with their problems find a way forward find a training course for them to actually help them at the moment securing the money even in what i would say is a wonderful system like finland um you know it still takes up a huge amount of effort and bureaucracy as lucas was saying but also um you know there's a reason why britain is one of the areas where it's, this is being most championed and there's some trials planned in scotland which have come from the grassroots up yeah, we have a dreadful welfare system that is leaving millions of people literally going hungry. Um, there's a serious food insecurity problem in the UK. So there's probably reasons why the UK is an area that's really pushing this. Um, so, but I also want to cite a case that's in the news today from the Netherlands, which I'm not an expert on the Netherlands social security, but it's a case of a, a, a Muslim man um, who's been denied, he and his wife have been denied benefits, been denied an income. Uh, because he was told to do a training course that required him to shave his beard off and he declined to shave his beard off and now he's been denied an income and that's the kind of thing that happens when you have conditionality society can put what I would say very rigid very unreasonable rules rules that some people just will not fit through and they'll be left penniless 
Thanks for that. Um, in a few minutes, we're going to be taking some questions for the participants who are tuning in. So to them, if they have any questions they want to ask, just post them into the chat and we will ask the speakers. Uh, in the meantime, I think we could ask a question about trade unions. So from your own knowledge, like what is the general response from trade unions? Are they supportive? Are they not? And why is that? Uh, Francine, if you'd like to answer. Well, let me mainly speak about trade unions I know at the European uh, trade union here in Brussels. Um, a large majority is absolutely against basic income, but there is a very simple reason for that. The reason is that the basic income takes away the responsibility from corporations and gives the responsibility to the government to pay for people and that is a real serious and urgent problem because what we see happening today is that corporations first of all they do not pay taxes or very little taxes secondly they try they try to um to avoid social contributions for social security and thirdly they even try to avoid wages and more and more they shift the responsibility for paying the costs of their labor, the labor force, and the costs of reproduction to the governments. And the reproduction of labor force should be paid by cooperation, should be paid by capital, not by the government. And that is, I think, the main reason why trade unions, apart from being very wicked once they lose their role, in the whole uh, management of social security, obviously. But the main reason is that basic income is a shift from corporations, from capital to the government. And it is the government that will have to pay for, uh, for, people's, um, for people's survival. It's as simple as that. And I think we cannot accept it. Production and reproduction go hand in hand. And production and reproduction should be paid by capital, not by the government. OK, thank you. Um, I think, Lucas, do you want to reply or state your thoughts? Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, I can speak on you know how I see the case in Finland. Uh, yeah, I also think in Finland, in general, trade unions are more against basic income and more uh, for um, means testing. And I mean, and this is basically, uh, I think the biggest reason for this is that at the, at the moment, trade unions are closely tied together with, with uh, unemployment funds who do this um, earnings related social security. And they are afraid that if, if, an, uh, if a basic income is brought into the, into the government, then they would kind of lose their base so to say for you know the reason for the existence and for their um uh for their um their um uh, uh, sorry the, the, for, for the people uh, and the funds so so i think this is also it's like politically it's a really big question and i think also like uh for younger generations it might it, it already, already kind of seems a bit uh, I, don't, I don't know outdated but it just seems like a different world where it's like where you have to get your social programs from the unions uh, instead of the governments. And, but I would, I would also see that this would be like a natural process that historically trade unions uh, pioneer new social programs. And then eventually those programs, when they're seen good, they become incorporated into the government, which would then kind of free up the trade unions to kind of pioneer the next uh, social innovation, and I, I also see it as a problem if uh, trade unions can become stagnated and cling on to taking care of one part of the of the social welfare state. So yeah, I, I would think uh, mm, it's a really interesting question that what happens if we get a basic income? What happens to trade unions? Will they be able to find in, in a way the next struggle to um, take part in? Or what will happen? And I mean, because uh, I also think that it's it's very important for trade unions to exist and to be active. So I would also be a, just a bit concerned myself. Also, what would happen to them? Thanks. And yes, Natalie. Um, well, what do you think will happen to trade unions? Uh, well, I think I, to come back first, perhaps on Francine's point about corporations being responsible for sorting, supporting reproduction and production. 
I mean, what we've seen in the UK is the state has been shrunk and shrunk and shrunk for ideological reasons. The wage share, the percentage of GDP going to workers has actually fallen by more than 10%. Um, now, that's partly because we have extremely restrictive trade union laws, and that's a huge problem specific to the UK, um, although perhaps in other countries have gone in that direction as well. Um, but if you actually make the state larger, which if you get the, the state collecting more of GDP from the corporations, then that means the state's controlling where that money is going rather than the corporations. And what our corporations have been doing is shoveling that money off into tax havens and that's of no benefit to anybody. And unless the state steps in, that's going to continue. Specifically on the trade union point, I think we're coming to an interesting issue here. Our trade unions, with some exceptions, have been very much opposed to the idea because they think that people get their identity, um, they should get their, their subsistence from paid work. Whereas the UBI is starting from a different philosophical place that says that there are many ways in which people can choose to contribute to society, and that might be paid work or it might be unpaid work. Um, you know, someone who's caring is contributing, huge family caring is contributing to society, but it's not a paid job. Someone who's running a local community group might be contributing enormously, but it's not a paid job. Uh, and you know, so there's so many roles in society that are not and are never going to be paid jobs uh, that UBI supports them. But our, you know, our unions have traditionally quite a few of them have been quite right wing and they've generally been opposed to benefits to any sort of social support system beyond the absolute bare minimum. So that's where a lot of our unions come from, certainly in the UK. OK, wow, thanks a lot. OK, um, I think we will go to some questions from participants now. It's quite good ones. OK, so the first question is, isn't the question of affordability caused by large money shifting? If we compare UBI and negative income tax, the negative income tax affects low income people and, may, and maybe even the rich people and may seem cheaper, whereas universal basic income affects all. So uh, let's see, Natalie, do you want to start answering that? Uh, yes, certainly. I mean, basically, the top line figure for what UBI costs um, looks high because you're paying it to everyone. And one of the questions that's always asked is why are you paying it to millionaires? But the advantage of that is that the administration costs, the bureaucracy is very low. In the UK, the um, basic income trust is calculated. It would cost about 1% of the total benefit to administer it. And of course, our model that we had it put out in 2015, anyone who was on more than about 26,000 pounds a year, 30,000 euro more or less, um, was not actually any wealthier. It was taken back off them in the tax rates. So it's a case of you have this simplicity of it being paid out and that gives you a high top line figure of the cost, but you're gonna recover a lot of that people who are earning more than a sort of median kind of salary, just pay it back. And so, you know, the real cost is much lower than the top line figure. That's quite good. OK, uh, Francine, do you want to either respond to Natalie or answer the original question in your own way? Yeah, with, the, with this negative income tax, again, we come to the problem of who pays wages, because a negative income tax means that if you do not earn enough for a living, the state, the government will pay the rest. And that means that wages can be kept very low. And that is exactly what corporations want. And that is what they will do. They will not raise the wages and they will want government to pay the difference so that everyone has indeed enough money to live from. But they will not pay for it. They will. Their wages will be subsidized and that is a problem. Thank you. And now, Lucas, you want to make any comments? Yeah, uh, as I said earlier, like with basic income or uh, negative income tax, the end result uh, is the same if you have the same effective marginal tax rate. So, uh, but but it is indeed true that like when you think about the, the psychological effects of either, uh, for example, like uh, if you have negative income tax, then it can be maybe easier to kind of, you know, put forward politically when when you say, yeah, we only pay this to those who need it and not to millionaires. That can be easier. But on the other hand, if you have basic income that is also paid out to millionaires, then it also 
kind of brings out the universalism better. So then, every, so everybody anyway in society and each income brand feels that they are in the same uh, boat, so to say. Uh, but um, like, I, if I look at my calculations, for example, with uh, negative income tax rates, it's maybe easier to compare to the current situation in Finland. Uh, actually, money going to the social programs is about the same. But where you need more funding is that you will actually have less income tax revenue coming because when you have the negative income tax, you first cannot pay out or pay back the basic income, and only then you start paying income tax. So that's in a way where the the extra costs come from. Uh, and, and also to our Francine's comment about the subsidizing wages, wages um, that, that could also I mean that can also be true, but at the same time. When you start giving out money for peop to people anyway for doing nothing, it also means that they might have higher requirements uh, for the wages because now uh, instead of just slacking off, I mean, and I, this is something that I don't expect most people to actually do. This is like a nightmare scenario that some people kind of want to um, kind of spread. But uh, yeah, w w when you have basic income, th then it means that you will actually have to be maybe even paid more to make yourself take out, take time out of your uh, leisure and to go to work. If I can just come in on, on the low wage point, I mean, perhaps I'm going to disagree with Lucas and kind of agree with Francine here just to shake it up a little and change it around. Because Lucas suggested that you could start with a low um, basic income and then build it up. But there is a problem and a risk if you have a very low basic income, just a small payment. Um, that that becomes like a wage subsidy and companies can pay workers less. I mean, I would say that UBI has to be brought, brought in at a level, at least that is a subsistence level that people can live on. Because then, of course, people can choose not to take a job if it doesn't pay enough for them to feel like it's worthwhile or if it is you know, horrible conditions. And so one of the things under UBI possibly if you think of really horrible jobs in society, and I often say sewer cleaners, although I did meet someone who said he loved his job as a sewer cleaner, but most of us might not fight to the idea of cleaning out the sewers. Um, maybe you would have to pay people a lot more money to do the job of being a sewer cleaner if they have the choice of living simply on a universal basic income. Maybe you would have to pay sewer cleaners more than you pay bankers. Maybe you should pay sewer cleaners more than you pay bankers. I think so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've got agreement. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah, good point. Uh, Lucas, do you want to come in or support? Okay. Uh, the next question is directed. Uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sorry, just a quick comment um, to Natalie. Uh, what was it? Uh, yeah, yeah uh, about, about the sub subsidizing um, uh, wages. I mean, actually, and uh, I don't I don't know, like, it's necessarily a bad thing because, uh, as I said earlier, like, in some future scenarios, it's seen that income and also uh, skills might become more polarized, especially like if we have more automation coming in the future, which means that then for some people, their productivity just simply isn't maybe high enough to um, to uh, add up to the minimum wages that we might, now might have. So in, in that case, it actually would make, makes more sense to kind of make it possible to employ those people also. But of course, this kind of comes back to the very philosophical need for work in general that do you even need a society where everybody would be you know working somewhere or can we just have leisure for all deep questions okay um one another question from participants is aimed at those in favor of ubi it is do you not think there is an issue in people receiving double benefits who don't need any this person is a student in Spain and some of their colleagues receive benefits as they are students whilst also working and getting money from that. So, um, Natalie, if you'd like to comment. Well, I think, I mean, as I said, the idea of universal basic income is everyone gets it. But if you're earning a decent amount of money, it comes back in tax. So you don't actually end up any bit financially better off. So it's not suggesting that people should actually get paid double. I mean, you know, what we we do suggest is, you know, for example, the way ours was structured was we had children were paid half a UBI from the point they were born, acknowledging the fact that you know, raising children costs 
a lot of money. Uh, and then also once you reach retirement age, then you would actually be paid a significantly higher pension because the assumption is once you've retired, you won't be doing paid work. So I think you know, it's not a case of people getting a double serving. It's simply a case of everyone having that security of enough for their basic needs. Great, thanks. And Lucas, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I think um, in the spirit of basic income is also the idea of not kind of classifying people in different statuses, which will, of course would mean that then like uh, when taken far enough, the idea of basic income would mean that there wouldn't be a student allowance or unemployment benefit separately, but it just would be the same basic income for all. So obviously then there wouldn't, would not be this uh, double benefit, so to say. Okay, thanks. And uh, Francine, we have a question directed to you. Um, you can comment on the previous things first if you want, or straight to the question, which is, what would be your proposal to ensure that corporations pay to ensure people are able to live well in society, especially in a scenario where unemployment is higher because of automation with corporations not directly paying any wages anymore? Yeah, right. This, this is a task for, for labor organizations. This is a task for trade unions. Um, I mean, the wages that are paid today, whether it is in the UK or in, or in Belgium or in France, let alone in the, in, in, in the countries of the South, these wages are far too low. And we have to make sure that corporations pay a right level of wages that can allow workers to have a life in dignity, a decent life. That is what, this is a social struggle and we never have had obtained any social right without the social struggle. And that is what we will have to do and continue to do. That is the task before us, the task of workers, the task of non-workers also. It's not only for workers, it's for all of us. We all need, and there again, I agree with, with the basic point starting point for 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 for, U, for ubi that we all need this economic and social security we all need this and part of that struggle is a worker struggle and part of that struggle will have to be done by trade unions okay thank you so much um this is a question aimed at everybody which is what do you think about reallocating common agricultural policy budgets to create ah. an agrarian <laughs> basic income, a right allocated to every food producer on an individual basis? Uh, I see Francine reacting. <laughs> so. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Why, why, why replace the common agricultural policy? We need it. It has to be reformed. It has to be made better. Absolutely. But we need it. I mean, your greens, you must see the importance of agriculture and i'm sure that you do so please keep this policy and make it better this is this is absolutely crucial for the future of all of us okay thank you um does natalie want to respond <laughs> um i spend a lot of my time i've just written a report for the european greens on soil carbon and spend a lot of time thinking about agriculture so trying to summarize this in a couple of sentences is quite hard but you know, we our agricultural system is entirely broken it's currently operates farmers are forced to operate to farm to make money uh, the secondary target is calories. We're not aiming to feed people well. So, for example, we need to grow um, at least twice, the world needs to grow at least twice as much fruit and vegetables. We all know we need to stop feeding good food to animals in factory farms and eat less meat. Um, the common agricultural policy has to be utterly changed around. And certainly in the UK, you know, the highest paid common agricultural policy payment goes to the Duke of Westminster, <laughs> because he owns massive quantities of land. Um, so you know, I entirely sympathise with the idea of changing the common agricultural policy, but I think the idea that you can take away payments to farmers, certainly particularly small farmers, family farms, um, is, is not a viable option and would you know, create huge problems. Great, thanks. Okay, um, just before we let Lucas speak, um, we'll have one last question ready from participants and then we'll wrap up. So first, Lucas on common agricultural policy. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks. Oh, okay, and uh, just first of all, I want to say this is a separate question, so it, it's by no means linked to basic income. Uh, but but personally, I think uh, uh, the cap is is not a good policy. Uh, we could use the money for much better purposes. Um, it's it's just not a an an efficient way to make sure that people have food basically uh that that can be taken care of other ways and it, but it is a very interesting um kind of counterpoint to basic income and I, i've also thought uh when talking about the national uh agricultural subsidies here in finland that if we just gave that same amount to the farmers uh, unconditionally it would actually you know I, I think they would also like it more because now they uh, at least in finland a lot of farmers they they really um, do not like all the bureaucracy that goes into agricultural subsidies, and uh, you know, instead, just give the same money to them because you know we're not talking. It's two different things to make sure that people have food, or to make sure that somebody, let's say a farmer, has a, a living. And with basic income, the idea, of course, is to make sure that they have the money, uh, regardless of how much they, they produce food, and then let the markets, the food markets, work. And then, of, of course, uh, when talking about um, making sure that people have enough money to buy food, that's also we come back to the social security and not the agriculture benefits. Uh, for the EU money that goes into uh, the cap, um, it, it, it would be really interesting to see like uh, what else we could do with that money. Is it more uh, science, more education, more interconnectedness, or just um, a smaller EU budget, for example? Mm. I mean, we also need to think about the ecosystem services that farmers provide in terms of potentially, you know, the space for wildlife, carbon storage, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not just about food. Um, yes, of course. <laughs> okay, I'll just jump in. Uh, there's one final question, if you guys could just answer really quickly before I do the wrapping up. Um, it is, what could be the role of the EU in supporting universal basic income? So um, I think, Lucas, do you want to jump in? Yeah, this is really interesting. Uh, I think what the EU is maybe most of all, at least until now, has been as a guiding participant in this discussion. So, like for example, making sure that, uh, or like making evaluations for each member state that are there so social security models or are are the sums up to date? Are they enough? Uh, I think this is very important uh, work to make sure that we have, you know, a decent living everywhere in the eu but as to possibly like even enacting a eu basic income that would be really interesting of course i would say also a pretty far out idea so far but it, it would be a interesting idea to have basic income on different levels so it's in a way basically with the subsidi subsidiary sub subsidiarity uh, principles so that you would have let's say 50 year olds across eu and then in like in each country you would have let's say well let's say like in finland you might have fa have 500 year olds and then also within finland and smaller groupings of areas you would also have uh s s let's say like 100 to 300 euros more depending on what's the cost of living in that area so you would you could even have like a three-tier system for basic income but that's, uh, let's say, maybe some decades away. <laughs> yeah, that's some cool stuff. Okay, just to really finish briefly, uh, Francine, do you have anything to add to what the EU maybe could do against UBI? I think the, I think the EU should uh, focus on economic and social human rights. That is the most important thing. Well, I, I, I would say that UBI is economic and social rights, but what the EU <laughs> could do is, is actually to focus um, uh, on trying to coordinate trials to make sure that they feed into each other and help support each other so we gain knowledge from them rather than individual nations and individual cities and whatever doing them independently. And so, for example, the Scottish people, I know they're looking to work with other trials like Utrecht to see if they can you know, get better data by working together with other people. So the UK, the EU could help to coordinate that. Great, thank you so much. Okay, uh, I think we have to bring this really interesting debate to a close. I know I've learned a lot, so I hope everybody else listening in has. 
Um, and so just to say a lot of thank yous. So first off to our wonderful speakers, Francine, Natalie and Lucas. It's been great listening to your expertise and I don't know if you want to promote anything such as social media or publications that people could like find out more about you. So, like Natalie, if there's anything to promote. Well, if I can just suggest the Green European Journal, if you Google that, you'll find lots of the stuff that I and others have done on UBI. Great, thanks. And Lucas? Um, yeah, maybe I could just say that uh, the, the Green Party in Finland now has their uh, updated uh, basic income model out, uh, It's but all their information isn't finished. And also uh, the Green Think Tank uh, will be publishing its findings on how to go towards that uh, and probably next month. I would say that's also in Finnish, but uh, I'll see if we can maybe get some English information out for that, maybe through um, Jeff. That'd be awesome. Jeff. Yeah. And uh, Francine, is there anything you want to plug? Yeah, just just to, to recommend to go and look at socialcommons.eu, where all the ideas on social protection as social commons are explained and also a whole explanation about UBI, what it can mean, what it cannot mean. And I just want to thank you. It was a pleasure to participate. Agreed. Thank you all. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, like final thank yous. I want to thank our wonderful co-spokesperson, Katri, for introducing FYG and being here. And just to remind everybody that you're interested in FYG work and activities, visit FYG. Um, dot org and visit all our social media. There's lots to do and get involved in. And some final thank yous. I want to thank FYG office, especially Jan from the communications officer for helping us set up and promote this awesome debate. Um, big thank you to Greg and Sam from the executive committee who have been amazing support to the social working group planning this webinar and everything else. And last but not least, major thank you to Sarah and Jamie, who are the coordinators of the social working group, because they have been wonderful keeping us all going and making sure everything is sorted. And of course, thank you to the working group in general, because they've been wonderful to talk to every two weeks. And thank you everyone for tuning in and enjoy your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Good night. <laughs>